you here with us this morning. If you're able, we would love for you to join us in a time of worship. And let's sing a song to our King. Let's put our hands together. Your name is the highest, your name 
is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them generations falling at the throne of God in worship and maybe when you sang that maybe you thought of a loved one or perhaps someone within scripture who will be alongside you in eternity in heaven with God worshiping but in that song there's a line that said for all who will believe meaning there's people right now that don't know Jesus but by his grace they will and they'll be with us there heaven praising God and I'm so thankful for that truth 
because as we just sang, that is only possible, not by any of us, but because God is holy, he is sovereign, he's powerful. And to this day, he still leaves the 99 to pursue the one. And I'm so grateful for that. And with that in mind, we're gonna continue in our worship and we're gonna do that by receiving an offering. If this is your first time here, we are so glad that you're here. We hope we get to meet you today. But please know we don't want anything from you, but we want God's best for you. But for the rest of us, we give to partner with God because here at Northridge, we wanna wake the world up to Jesus and to tell them his love. But before we give, let's pray together. Lord, God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time to worship you. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, that although, yes, we're so grateful that you took on flesh and blood, you also, Lord, at the same time are holy. You're not like us, God. I'm so thankful you're not like me. You're so other than me, God. And so we thank you for that truth, God. And Lord, we pray for this offering. We pray that your will would be done and your kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. So thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for each and every person in this room. Thank you for the sunshine outside. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. You may have a seat. Hey, Northridge family, my name is Levi and I'm the pastor of Next Generations here. And we're so glad you're here. Whether you've been coming a long time or you're brand new, like this little guy. Aww. Welcome, it's great to have you. Hey, we wanna let you know about our Discover Northridge class, which is coming up in April, April 16th, 23rd, and 30th. And this is a class, if you're brand new to Northridge or you wanna know how to take next steps here at our church, we wanna invite you out to Discover Northridge. We're gonna tell you a little bit about who we are, where we've been, but more excitingly, where we're going and how you can be a part of what God's doing in and through this church. Classes take place during our 1116 service here in Plymouth and our 916 service up at our Brighton location. If you're interested in being a part of this class, head to northridgechurch.com slash discover and sign up today. I'd love to stay and chat more, but uh, I gotta go change a diaper. Okay. We gotta deep dive this thing and really understand our role. We go where you lead and go beyond what we know. Are you sure? Cause I plan, I tend to execute, I follow through. And you say your wisdom doesn't lead to execution, but birth. So, this difference between starting a thing and making it new is decided between what I do on my own and what I give to you. It's the mouse in the wheel versus the bird in the sky. And the path we take depends on whose sight we rely. And this is part of a continuum. All these traits I employ, trust, wisdom, discipline, choice, leads to this thing called joy. And that holds me together, content, confirmed. I don't fall, I, I don't fail, I fall forward, I don't lose, I learn. I see now, my charge is constant perfecting. There will always be something alluring or tempting, but if I seek your face, at home or on stage, you will walk with me till the end of the age.
live free. Would you give Kari Turner a big Northridge thank you? I mean, how awesome is that? And, and just so you know, Kari is a part of the Northridge family, and as with all volunteers, we're so grateful to him for sharing his creative gift and his creative passion with us. If you're a guest, you wouldn't know this, but for the 10 weeks of this Proverbs series, we've been watching Kari on video giving his poem. But I loved having him live, right? And you, you knew... You knew he was live because he was wearing different clothes. I mean, I, he changed on us, and that was really, really neat. For this finale weekend in this series on Proverbs, he actually added to his poem. He took it further, and I love how he ended it. He says, but I seek your face at home or on stage. You will walk with me till the end of the age. And I just love it because this whole series on God's wisdom has been about declaring that if we walk in God's ways, we will always have hope, and that's how we ended it. Hope is alive, my friends. Hope is real, and hope is available for all of us. So, so glad you're here. As we continue to move through God's wisdom and Proverbs, in fact, as we turn to our final conversation in this entire series... We're calling it Live Free. Because as I studied the book of Proverbs, I, I just knew that I couldn't bring this series to an end without talking about God's wisdom as he delivered it in that book, Proverbs, on financial freedom. Financial freedom. Nothing holds more people in bondage in a practical way in our lives than the issue of finances, and God addresses it. Look at how he says it in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, obviously now he's talking about the, the discipline of finances, the area of finances. If you have put up security for your neighbor, if you've struck hands in pledge for another, you've made promises financially you can't deliver, if you've been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, to free yourself. And he talks about his wisdom, about how to overcome. But the big thing was, do what you can to free yourself. God's wisdom is about helping us to find freedom, which so few people really have. Look at Proverbs 22.7, another bit of God's wisdom. The rich rule over the poor. And the borrower is servant to the lender. The borrower is a slave of the one who's lending. It's about financial bondage. It really is. In fact, here's the reality that will form the ultimate conflict, the tension point with us as human beings, with God's truth. Most people are in bondage financially. Most people, not a few, not some, most people. So you take a community like we have here with thousands of people right now, and, and you just need to know, most of us are in financial bondage. Now, that's hard to really internalize because none of us like to think of ourselves as being in bondage and prison and all that different stuff, but it's, in the area of finances, a reality. But you'll never arrive at this reality if you have the wrong idea about it because most think that, well, financial bondage, that's really dramatic. That only refers to those who are in significant debt. Not normal debt like us, you know, credit card debt and car debt and mortgage debt. Not, not normal stuff. You know, people who are extravagantly in debt. I mean, you've heard about these people who are in $100,000 of debt because of school and those things. Those are the people. The ones going bankrupt. Those are the people in financial bondage. But that's just, that's just wrong. Financial bondage is far bigger than just significant debt and bankruptcy. So I thought I'd just so you can 
see if you fit in this, give you some of the symptoms of financial bondage. And just so you know, I'm not speaking at you as one who's delivered from all bondage. Here I am. I'm awesome. I'm speaking to you as one like you who experiences difficulty with this. Financial bondage comes with the symptom of worry and anxiety. Because when you're worried and anxious about finances, it becomes a driver, it becomes a push, it becomes a motivation, it becomes something that holds you down. Nothing worse than worry and anxiety, right? That's not freedom, that's bondage. Symptom of financial bondage is stress. It affects your thinking, it affects your behavior, it affects your emotion, it affects your physical well-being. Stress, and all of us in one season or another have experienced stress financially, right? How are we going to make the ends meet? How, how are we going to do this in our life? And it doesn't matter the season you're in. Stress can be alive and well. But if you're filled with financial stress, you're not free. You're in bondage. Another symptom of financial bondage is insecurity. You're not secure. You're not sure where it's going to come from. And this isn't about how much you have or don't have. This is about how you view money and your need for it. Financial insecurity is not freedom, it's bondage. It keeps us guessing, it keeps us doubting, it keeps us in misery, and it becomes a primary driver in our lives. Another symptom is fear. I mean, there's been a lot of fear about finances lately, right? I mean, the inflation thing going up, and when's the stock market going to collapse, and When's the job market going to collapse? And are we really headed into a recession? What's going to happen to our houses? Is 2008 going to be repeated? And all this stuff. People living in very real fear. But if you're living in fear, you're not living in freedom. Another symptom of financial bondage is envy. Can't be happy with where I am because I know where you are. Another symptom of financial bondage is obsession. And I'm telling you, finances can be a real obsession. Primary focus, primary driver, primary motivation in our life. I mean, we're obsessed with it. And that could be you, but if you're obsessed with something other than God, you're not free. You're in bondage. And I'll just give you one more, and then this might really encourage you engineers to make an even bigger list, but for the rest of us, this is probably enough. Uh, a symptom is dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction. And I don't know the human being that hasn't experienced great seasons of dissatisfaction financially, and I'm talking poor and rich and uber-rich alike. And I can describe it this way, I think. How much is enough when it comes to money? What's the answer? A little bit more. Never satisfied. I need more. I want more. I need more. I want more. And if you're in a place where you need and want more, you're not free. You're in bondage. So you see, this is way beyond those who are in significant debt. This is way beyond those who have made decisions that led to bankruptcy, but this is for all of it. This is for me, I have to tell you. And, and I also have to say, I don't like talking about it because to talk about it, I have to research it and study it and see all that God says, which makes me accountable. I don't like to talk about it because then not only am I accountable to God, but I've got thousands of people looking at me and saying, you taught about this. And it's like, oh, I hate teaching about this. And if you're a guest here, and this is your first time ever here, how cliche, right? Everybody says the church is only interested in money. You come for the first time to Northridge, and what am I talking about? Money. Just so you know, haven't talked about it in a very, very long time. But I'm talking about today. So if this is your first time, God probably knew you needed it. It's just a, I don't know. Just a thought, could be. But 
it's a real issue when it comes to experiencing God's best and freedom or life's worst and bondage. Because can I tell you something about those systems, those symptoms? We wouldn't experience those symptoms if we were genuinely free. In fact, we wouldn't experience these symptoms if we genuinely knew God and were trusting Him. Because, you see, when you really know and trust God, you know He owns it all. When you really know and trust God, you know He knows you and wants what's best for you. When you really know and trust God, you know that following him leads to satisfaction, not dissatisfaction. You can't walk with God and trust God and live in bondage to worry, anxiety, stress, insecurity, fear, envy, obsession for money, or dissatisfaction. And Jesus is the one that said it, just so you know, Matthew 6, 31 to 32. Do not worry, Jesus says, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? I need more, I want more, I have to have more, fear, worry, and all those things. For that's what the pagans do. Pagans are a word for saying those who don't know God, who don't trust God. For the pagans run after all these things because it's all they have. But you who know God know your heavenly Father knows that you need them. You trust him. That eliminates fear, that eliminates stress, it eliminates everything. I don't know about you, I look at this and I go, me, 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 me. Man, I need this, don't you? You wanna live free? It's what God wants for you. So here's the truth that forms the basis of this final conversation out of the book of Proverbs. Financial bondage and freedom are ultimately spiritual issues. A lot of people don't think you should talk about finances in church because those are worldly, material things. They have nothing to do with Jesus or God. Well, I just showed you how Jesus talked about this. I just showed you about God's wisdom. That couldn't be further from the truth because at the heart of financial bondage and at the heart of financial freedom is the reality of the spiritual issues in our lives. Bondage and freedom in any area of life is a spiritual issue. They stem from where we are in our relationship with God. And you know, one of the reasons we hate hearing about finances so much is because it's often one of the greatest points of tension between us and God. And we like to pretend we're better with him than we are. We like to declare our trust in him and what great followers of Jesus we are. But this is where it gets real. And it's important. Look at Proverbs 11:4. Talk about a spiritual issue. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath. When we meet God, you know, whether we were rich or poor is not going to matter in the least. But righteousness, living according to his right ways, delivers us from death. It's a spiritual issue. Look at Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. This is Jesus. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. And remember, for those that don't think we should be talking about finances, this is Jesus talking. And he says, you cannot serve both God and money. You're going to either serve God or serve money. And then Jesus declares this in John 8, 32. Then you will know the truth, and the truth, his truth, will set you free. I'm going to tell you this is a big deal. Here's the spiritual issue. Are we living for the kingdom of God, or are we living for the kingdom of me? In the kingdom of God, he provides in the kingdom of me, money provides. Jesus says you can't serve both. You just can't. The spiritual issue is, am I focused on him and his, or am I focused on me and mine? And the difference is freedom or bondage. And you need to know all of us are somewhere on this continuum, continuum between me and God, my kingdom and his kingdom. And the key, as we saw in John 8, 32, the key to knowing freedom is to align ourselves with and live according to God's truth. 
That sets us free. And that's our whole conversation this weekend. Everything's going to be about how can we know his truth, choose it, so we experience freedom. And that's all Jesus wants for us. That's all I certainly want for me and for you. And so we're going to look at God's ways to living financially free. And I have to tell you, there are a bunch of principles. Can't talk about them all. But the ones I talk about, I can't talk about them with all the complexity involved. But here's what I'm looking for. For you to know it, see it, and figure out if that's a tension point for you. And if it's a tension point for you, it's something that you can then spotlight to work on yourself to dive into the complexities on your own. Does that make sense? So, God's way to living financially free, to move closer to the continuum of God instead of me. Here's the first principle. We have to see, we want freedom. We have to see and manage money in view of eternity. I don't know about you, but that's not how I view money. Get a paycheck, put it in the bank. Ooh, have that. Now I can buy a TV. Now I can get an iPad. Ooh, maybe a new car. Maybe I have to sell that car because I'm not getting enough. It's like, it's all about that, but that's temporary. That's now stuff. If we're going to live free, we have to manage money in view of eternity. I think our biggest problem when it comes to money is that we have too limited a view. Here's our view. Now. How we feel now, what we want now, what we need now. But living for the temporary always leads to bad choices, to shortcuts. Good example of shortcut. Borrowing money to gain prosperity. What? Dig a hole to get out of the hole. What? It doesn't work. God already said the borrower is slave to the lender. It doesn't work. It makes the promise. It just doesn't work. And so look at how God talks about viewing money in light of eternity. Cast but a glance at riches, and they're gone. That's what money is in the temporary. For they'll surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. All of us know that. doesn't matter how much we make. Pfft. It tends to go away like mist. Then he says in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, this is Jesus. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Stop viewing your finances in light of the now. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For your treasure is where your heart is. He's saying, view your money through the lens of eternity. Are you? Most of us don't, which is why we're in bondage. Man, if I'm viewing my finances through the lens of eternity, I'm not going to have fear for the moment. I'm not going to be insecure in the moment. I know who God is and that he'll provide. And some people say, well, how, how do I lay up treasures for eternity? And they think, oh, I know. I lay up for treasures in eternity by giving to the church, right? That's what it is. That's all you're after here. No. Giving is certainly a part of laying up treasures in heaven, but that's not. There are, there are churches and pastors who, it's like every other day, they're preaching about give, 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 here, 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 here. But I'm telling you, it's absolutely wrong. It's a part but it's not the whole. The truth is we lay up treasures for eternity by fulfilling the responsibilities that God has given us. And so in the areas of finances, it's not just giving, but it's taking care of our family. It's not living for money, but it's actually living to love our family. Money is just a secondary part. Too many people, though, love money so much they throw away their family, their relationships, quality lives. That's not how to lay up treasures in heaven. We lay up treasures in heaven by pursuing God-given purpose in our life, his calling instead of our wants. But the truth is most people vocationally are following their want for more financial security instead of their calling and their purpose from God. That's not how to lay up treasures for eternity. It's not by pursuing financial prosperity. It's by honoring God, by saving and being generous and, 
and appropriately spending. And so is your view eternal or temporary? By nature, it's temporary. So unless you've been intentional, you've got your answer. Maybe that's something you need to look at. If we're going to experience God's ways to living financially free, another principle, we have to trust God with the whole money issue. And I understand that that's not a really glitzy way to say it. We have to trust God with the whole money issue. I spent time trying to find a better way to say that. But whole money issue says it best. With the whole of our finances, we need to trust God with every aspect. Beginning, middle, end. Size, quantity, quality, all of it. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. When he's talking about all your ways, too many leave God literally out of their finances. They think that's too petty, that's too worldly. I've got to trust God with my soul. I've got to trust God with heaven. I've got to trust God with forgiveness. Ooh, really churchy things. But I don't have to trust God with money. All your ways. All your ways. All your heart, because if part of your heart's leaning to the kingdom of me, you'll never experience God. Sadly, when we leave him out, of our finances, we end up in the wrong place. Look at 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money. I've heard this preached so wrong by so many people. They say, money's the root of all evil. Money's the root of all evil. So this is what they usually say. So give me your money. <laughs> There's a screw loose for anyone that listens to that. And they're popular. They've got big names. They've got millions of followers. Their churches are filled. Yeah with people who want more of now instead of more of Jesus and forever. Turn them off. Don't listen to them. They're wrong. It's not money that's the root of all kinds of evil. It's the love of money. Jesus said it. Do you love God or money? You can't love them both. Not equally. Some people eager for money, what have they done? They've wandered from the faith. Remember, we're supposed to trust God in the whole money issue. And when we don't, we wander from the faith. And what happens? They get pierced. Their life gets wrecked with many griefs. And this is where many in our world are today because we've bought the wrong line. We don't trust God in this area. Realize, and I hope you'll get this phrase because this is really important. Trusting God as your provider leads you to pursuing more of God trusting money as your provider leads you to pursuing more money. Who are you pursuing? One leads to freedom, the other to bondage. If you want to do God's ways to financial freedom, another principle, we have to work in order to expect God to provide. We have to work in order to expect God to provide. Look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. He's basically saying, look, at, if you expect God to provide for you when you're lazy, you're expecting the wrong thing. And I see a lot of people like this. Our culture is filled with this in every generation, by the way. Oh, God, give me more. God, give me more. God, give me more. No, I'm not willing to take that, hundred, that, that $15 an hour job. I, I, I'm waiting for the $120 an hour job. But give me more. I, do you have a screw loose or something? It's ridiculous. You can't expect God to provide when you're not even willing to take the opportunities he gives you to work. And not everybody has all the same opportunities. Not everybody has the same circumstances and background. But God will give you opportunities to work. And if you don't seize those, I promise you, you can't expect him to provide. Because he's the one to say, look at another one. 2 Thessalonians 3.10. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. If you want to expect God to provide, you have to be willing to work. But this is Northridge. 
None of you are like this. This is for other people. This is for other people. This is for you to attack all those people out there that are very unlike us, diligent, hardworking people. So let's move on to the next principle, <laughs> all right? Some of you are going, got, got through that. Next one. You want to do finances God's way to experience freedom? Then we have to be genuinely generous. We have to be genuinely generous. And I just need to tell you right now, most people are not generous. Not with money. They might be generous with a lot of things, but most people are not generous with money. I, I, I'm going to give you some clear data. It's true here at Northridge, and it's true in every spiritual community I know of. It's data. The vast majority of people, even in churches, don't give. They're not generous. People look at all the people coming north and say, this place must be rich. Yeah, if more than 10% gave. It's crazy. And yet we declare our love for God and our worship of God and he's our everything. Oh my gosh, he's our provider. He's so good. Oh, oh, oh I love him, I love him. But they don't give. Jesus says you can't love money and love God, it's one or the other. And here's what I know. When you genuinely love something, you can't give it away. I would never give my God away. I love him. But some people have made money their God and guess what they can't do? They can't give it away because that equals fear and stress and anxiety and dissatisfaction. Generosity is an absolute requirement for freedom. Because if you can't be generous, you're in bondage. And this isn't me now. Some of you are going, you haven't shown me a verse yet. Okay. <laughs> Proverbs 22, 9. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Now, I want you to know, it doesn't say, the generous will be rich. <laughs> if anyone tells you that if you give, God will make you rich, run, 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 run away. It's wrong. Because what they're saying is, if you want to be rich, give to me so I can be rich, and I'll set the example. That's a joke. But God never says, give and you'll be rich. He says, when you're generous, you'll be, what's that word? blessed, much more important than rich. I've seen poor, poor people who are unbelievably blessed and full of God's promises, and I've seen rich people who are under the curse, filled with bondage. Blessing is what we need from God, not more money for they share their food with the poor. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this, whoever sows, that's being generous, gives sparingly, will also reap sparingly. Reap sparingly of what? God's blessing. And I have people say, oh, how come other people are experiencing God's blessing and his promises and his fullness so much? Well, I'll tell you why. They're not making money, they're God. They're not hoarding all this other stuff. They're generous. And then it says, and those who sow bountifully, generously, will also reap generously. And then it goes further. Some of you are going, no, I thought it was over there. No, it goes further. Verse 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Someone who gives in trust and worship, not out of duty. And God is able to bless, bless you abundantly. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. If you're going to be free financially, you have to be genuinely generous. Most aren't. Are you? A couple of observations on this. True gain in life comes through giving, not through hoarding. When we don't give, we rob ourselves of all God wants to pour into us. And you know what's really sad? The more people have financially, the less they tend to give percentage-wise. 
It's, you, it's really low-income, low-middle-income people who tend to give the most percentage-wise. Well, God gave me $10,000. I'm going to give him 1000 That's 10%. I'm going to do it. I need him. I want him. Then a rich person, you know, gets a million dollars, and they go, $100,000? I can't give that much. Someone gets $20 million. Two million dollars? Can't give that much? It's the same thing, it's 10%. And by the way, does the person who makes 10,000 and gives 1,000 end up better economically than the person that makes 20 million and gives 2 million? Let's see, one has 9,000 left, the other has 18 million left. And yet this is reality. I'm telling you this is reality. Very often, the more God allows us to have financially, the more we can't let go, the more in bondage we are. Like the story of the rich fool that Jesus talks about. Wow. When we don't live God's principles, another observation, when we put ourselves in financial bondage, we rob ourselves of the great joy of giving. Some of us, because we haven't lived by God's principles of finances, are in such a deep hole of bondage that we couldn't give if we wanted to. And what does that do? It fills us with guilt and shame and heartache instead of joy. And it's all because we're not living God's way. Okay, before I knew, move to the next principle, I need to ask, Having fun yet? Isn't this a blast? Isn't this exciting? Don't you love it when I talk about things that aren't relevant to you? Yeah. I know. This is like, think about this. I had to work for months getting this stuff together and to give you a talk. You only have to put up with me for like 40 minutes. That's not bad. But this is really important. If you're going to do God's way and experience financial freedom, you have to learn to spend. Some of you go, I've learned that already. There's another part. We have to learn to spend with self-control. That's God's way. Now, Amazon has taught us, no, spend because our cool vans with the blue arrow will show up at your house. It's awesome. And then you can monitor your packages on your nest or your ring. It's so awesome. It's there. I can't wait to get home. The only problem is that's where bondage comes from. We have to learn to spend. This is why Amazon doesn't sponsor me, by the way, just so you know. Uh, I'm not wearing Amazon-sponsored shirts. And we have to learn to spend with self-control. Look at, God says this, Proverbs 13, 4. The sluggard craves, desires, wants everything, but gets nothing. The sluggard's the lazy person. But the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. I mean, God's making this so clear, you know? The diligent are self-controlled, don't say yes to everything. They understand how much resource they have, and they understand they need to self-control when it comes to spending that. And you need to know, and I'll show you another passage that declares this later, but there's nothing wrong with enjoying God's provision, nothing at all. He just doesn't want us to live for stuff. He wants our primary enjoyment not to be when a package shows up on our doorstep, but when we experience Him in life. We need to spend with self-control, with limits. Uh, another beautiful proverb, chapter 25, verse 28, like a city whose walls are broken. And just so you know, it used to be that uh, walls around the city were their sign of health and defense and ability to enjoy their life with the walls, but like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. You have no defense, you have no ability to be free or fulfilled. You'll be destroyed by it. You see, our problem isn't generally the lack of resources, our problem is generally a lack of self-control. In fact, more often than not, the more we have, the less we control what we have because we're not used to saying no to ourselves. So use self-control. Don't spend all you have. Save, invest, give appropriately. 
Okay, so those are some of God's ways to financial freedom. But the real question is, what's the ROI? Right? I mean, I know what the ROI of getting new stuff is. Adrenaline and then down. It's like high, low. But what's the ROI for living God's way? Well, if you apply all of his principles, here's the result. You live life that is truly life. You experience life that is truly life. Uh, let me just show you a couple of passages. Proverbs 11:4: wealth is worthless. I've already shown you this. In the day of wrath. But man, righteousness delivers us from death, from bondage, gives us freedom. God's ways gives us freedom, life that's really life. The other doesn't. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 17. Command those who are rich in this present world, and just so you know, even those of us who are caught up in the social safety net of America are richer than the vast majority of people all around the world. We're fighting to get people water all around the world as a church. I mean, so we are classified as people who have enough. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, it's temporary, but to put their hope in God, eternal, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Verses 18 and 19, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, treasures in heaven instead of on earth so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Most people are just existing. Most people are in bondage, in prison, in agony of worry and anxiety and fear and dissatisfaction and insecurity. That's not living. But Jesus said he came to give us life and life in all of its fullness. When we live God's principles in our finances, it leads to a free and fulfilled life. No wonder most people aren't experiencing it because they don't live by God's principles. Are you? So here, as we come to the end of this conversation, is our choice. Isn't it beautiful that God's given us the freedom to make a choice? doesn't force himself on you, doesn't force his ways on you. Here's our choice. God's way or our way. That's the choice. And by the way, it's got whew, really different results. When we choose God's way, it leads to freedom. When we choose our way, it leads to bondage. So you know what God's wisdom says? If I'm in bondage, I've chosen it. He's made freedom possible. Are you in bondage? You've chosen it. Stop blaming everybody else on the planet and start realizing that you have a choice. Look at Jesus took what I've already shared with you further in Matthew chapter 6. We've seen, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For those who don't know God, run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But this we haven't seen yet. So here's what he said to do. Seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, God's ways. And all these other things will be given to you as well. You'll be able to live free, not in bondage. So where are you? The continuum between me and God. Where are you? Bondage to freedom. Where are you? And I would bet if you're at all wired up like me, you're nowhere close to fully God's, which is where the bondage comes in, which is where the lack of blessing comes in. And I just want to encourage you, spend some time with God talking about this. And I'm going to give you a second to do that in just a minute. But some of you, maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're here. You've never experienced Jesus giving you freedom. 
That's why he came. He lived the perfect life we failed to live. He died so that he could forgive us for our sin and guilt, and he rose so that he could give us new life so our failures aren't final. But you have to choose him, have you? So what I want to encourage you to do right now is I want to encourage you to bow your heads with me in a word of prayer and talk to God whatever's relevant to you in this moment. But if you don't know Jesus, pray with me. You don't have to be demonstrable. You don't have to be dramatic. Just take my words in this prayer and make them your sincere expression to God in faith. Just say, Jesus, I, I need you. I don't deserve you. I've sinned, I've blown it, I haven't followed your ways. But you died on the cross to forgive me. By faith, I'm asking you to forgive me. You rose again to give me new life. By faith, I'm asking you, give me that new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just prayed with me, let us know. You can see on the screens, one word message, Northridge, to the text number 31616. We'll send you a link, fill that out, get it back to us. We wanna give you a book of the Bible in journal form and some other things that can help you build a relationship with God. But now, as a creative and interactive shared community experience to mark the end of this series and to stamp it on our hearts, we're going to do what we call a verbal call and response, and it's adapted right out of the book of Proverbs. So I'm going to lead off by making a statement out of Proverbs, and then you're going to interact with me by joining with me in saying the next statement, just so there's real clarity. What I'm going to say alone will be in white. <laughs> what you're going to say with me will be in yellow. And now that you know that, if you don't say what's in yellow, you have no hope of eternal life. No, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. I'm just kidding. But really, don't leave me hanging. This will be beautiful expression just before we move into worship. Would you stand with me? God gave us the Proverbs for attaining wisdom and instruction for understanding words of insight. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the For understanding proverbs and parables, the saying and riddles of the wise, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Let us seek God's will in all we do, and God will show us. Because everyone who finds wisdom is joyful. Happy are those who gain understanding. Wisdom is a tree of life. And then all of us together say, let us worship God, and let's do it together right now.
plus reasons to worship him. Let's choose freedom over bondage and we'll never, ever regret it. Now, just before we go, I have a couple of things to share that I think are really important to you or I wouldn't share them. So you can be seated just for a minute. That gives me 20 more minutes with you. Uh, that's not true. The first thing is, don't let this be the last time you think about this. Freedom's too important. Our teams actually put together activities that can help you take what you just experienced on the weekend to every day. And this Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night, we're doing a financial freedom thing. In an ongoing way as a church, we have Financial Peace University, ways you can learn his things. But this Wednesday night, we're going to be looking at managing resources God's way. We're going to be looking at traps and pitfalls and finances. We're going to have an opportunity to look at leaving a legacy through the area of finances. And, but to experience it, you have to choose to get there. Two ways. You can text us the word NEXT to our number, 31616 and we'll send you a link and you can see all that's going on and register or instant gratification. You can walk out of the auditorium here into the glass room right behind the auditorium and they can tell you all about it right now. I encourage you to take that step. Be here Wednesday night if this is relevant to you. And finally, two weeks from this weekend is Easter. Easter's coming. It's going to be unbelievable. 
Our team has been working and praying for what happens on Easter for a long time because the world is without hope and Easter is all about the hope of Jesus. But the only way they discover it is if we invite them. I believe all around our communities are people who are crying out in crisis to God. If you're real, show me the way. If there's hope, let me find it. And I believe God is wanting you to be the answer of prayer for someone, but to do it, you have to step into an invite. So when you came in, we gave you these invitations. You are loved, Easter at NorthridgeChurch.com. You can give them to anyone you meet over the next couple of weeks, and it'll take them right to the site. We have seven services here in Plymouth and two in Brighton. It's going to be phenomenal. And if you think I'm just really trying, do you realize the less people who come, the less services I have to do? So this isn't about us. This is about sharing the hope of Jesus. And if you'd like to share the hope digitally, all you have to do is text the word INVITE to our number, 31616, and we'll send you the digital invitation. Be inviting people. Be inviting people. And don't invite them all to the 1116 Sunday Easter service. That will be a nightmare of nightmares. That's why we're doing Friday and Saturday and Sunday and try and do a bunch of off time stuff. But I'm so glad you were here. I'm so grateful you've taken the journey through Proverbs with us. Now it's our choice. Choose God's way. It's the way to freedom. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you.